Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Archoria SQ8TV tutorial series. Today we're going to be dealing with a couple of sections, the uh, low frequency oscillators and the mixer. Uh, check out the Patreon link in the description below or the YouTube join button to become a channel member. A fantastic way to help support me and my channel. Okay, LFO first, low frequency oscillator. This is a wave that's currently not doing anything. This triangle here is bouncing backwards and forwards and it's having no effect on the sound whatsoever. That's because a low frequency oscillator needs to be assigned as a modulation source to something else in the synthesizer before it can do anything. So if, for instance, we assign this LFO to the pitch of oscillator one by clicking the hidden secret button, now it's all very well and good to map the modulation source to a destination, but we have to give it a modulation amount as well. So I'm going to click in the little yellow button and I'm going to drag up with my mouse and you can see what's happening on the interface. Because this is a bipolar oscillator, in other words, it revolves around zero. You can see the modulation amount increasing positively and negatively. And you can also see that little blue dot bouncing backwards and forwards, basically in accordance with whatever this is doing. So this oscillator is matching this wave. If I change the shape of the low frequency oscillator to a ramp, now you'll see that modulation amount change. Let's see what happens when we press a key on the keyboard. So here's the pitch of the oscillator increasing in accordance with the LFO. Did you also note that when I pressed the note, the LFO was about here, and so we kind of jumped on part way in between. We can amend that behavior by engaging the reset button. And now every time I press a key on the keyboard, the LFO is gonna begin right back from the very beginning. And you see that represented in the blue dot, blue dot as well. We can add a little bit of variance to the low frequency oscillators. This human button basically just very slightly randomizes the oscillator. And even though we've not talked about the mixer yet, it is actually representing, accidentally as it happens, what's going on with LFO1. You can see that LFO1 is currently being represented in the mixer and you can see the sawtooths being drawn. If I engage human mode, now you can see that just little bit of variance. So that pitch increase is not quite completely linear anymore. Poly is a complete headbender. The best way to demonstrate this is to turn the rate of the LFO down really slow. So here we're currently set in Hertz mode, which means that it's in complete cycles. I'm gonna get it going really slowly. And by engaging poly, it means every voice on the synthesizer has its own low frequency oscillator trigger. So I'm gonna press a note, I'm gonna get that thing cycling up, and then I'm gonna press a different note at a different period and you'll hear those two notes basically be out of sync with each other. Every one of those voices was completely independent and not in my control. If we come out of Hertz mode and switch to sync mode, it'll now be linked to the host BPM, which is currently 90. And as you can see, we've got fractional increments thereof. So if I set that to one, basically going to take an entire bar to complete one period of the oscillator, set it to half. It's going to speed up by double, obviously. Over on the right hand side, we've got the amplitude scale. Now this isn't volume. This is amount of LFO being applied. This is where the term amplitude is really context sensitive and you need to be careful not to kind of internally hardwire it to the word volume. It's got nothing to do with volume. If I switch to a sine wave, it's an easier way to demonstrate uh, what, the, uh, what the amp slider does. As I drag this down, it basically means the LFO is gonna be having less of an effect. The amount of positive and negative modulation that's being applied by this LFO is being decreased. Its effect is going to be reduced. So, quite a subtle pitch change. Now increasing and decreasing the amp slide over, over here is effectively equivalent to uh, increasing or reducing from the destination side as well. So I'll do exactly the same effect, but this time I'll achieve it by decreasing and increasing the modulation amount. 
because the period of oscillation is never changing, it's always the same speed. If I simply make that thing do less work, then it's exactly the same as if I reduce the amplitude of the oscillator itself, just looking at it from a different perspective. The reason why that's significant is because you, you might map um, an LFO to multiple different sources. And so you've got one fundamental kind of master amplitude control in the oscillator, but then different modulation amounts on your different destinations. But try not to get too hung up on the, on the differences. Essentially, they are performing an equivalent task. Okay, that's all the easy stuff as far as the LFOs are concerned. The last one to deal with is a little bit confusing because the way it's been implemented on this synthesizer is a bit weird. And it's to do with these initial and delay settings. What I'm going to do is demonstrate the effect first. And then we'll come back and have a talk about what's going on. What I'm going to do is basically have it so that when I press a note, we initially don't hear um, any vibrato, any pitch variance. And then over a period of time, the pitch variance is going to basically be introduced. It's going to bloom and then achieve its full level. Really common effect that's used in lots of instruments. When people, when human beings are physically playing musical instruments, this is a thing that they very commonly do. They'll hold the note flat and then they'll begin the vibrato. Let's try and emulate that. The, what that's the effect I wanted and you can actually see on the mixer that kind of loud loud hailer kind of concept as the vibrato expands now the reason it's unusual in this synthesizer is because the way the delay command is implemented it's kind of back to front as far as my logic's concerned because what this delay command specifies is how quickly the oscillator modulates from its initial value which is zero, its initial amplitude, up to the maximum amplitude specified by this slider. So we're going from no oscillation to full oscillation this quickly. Normally in synthesizers, the delay command tells you how fast something gets there. On this synthesizer, it tells you how slowly it gets there. So it's kind of a, it really messes with my head. If I make the delay level very fast, and press a note. See the uh, vibrato kicks in almost immediately. Really, really small period of time over which the oscillator blooms from nothing to full. Now, unfortunately, there's a little bug in the interface. Um, this delay time, I should be able to right click and increment in absolutely tiny fractions. So this should be the, the, the longest or slowest possible bloom from zero to maximum modulation, but this isn't gonna work. The modulation kicks in straight away. And actually it's basically random as to what the minimum period of time is before it actually does start working. So I would basically say if you use 0.01 as the effective minimum value, you won't go wrong. And that always does seem to work, but in thousandths, there's this little bit of kind of rounding bug that seems to be um, in the software. This initial value lets us specify what the starting modulation amount is. So if I increase that to 0.5 or there or thereabouts, it's not going to start at completely nothing. There's going to be a little bit of vibrato. And then you see the vibrato also expand over time as the, as the modulation kicks in. So this is clunky, and <laughs> the implementation of these two features uh, in this synthesizer is pretty clunky. Okay, let's have a look at the mixer now. What this basically allows us to do is to combine two different modulation sources together mathematically using one of these six different algorithms, looking at multiply at the moment. Uh, and you can see that I've dialed in LFO1, uh, which is a sine wave, a fairly slow sine wave. And over in my oscillator, I've mapped the mod mixer to my modulation destination instead of uh, the LFO that we had previously. You can also see that I've dialed in quite a big arc. Now the size of this arc is really important. The way I'm gonna to try to demonstrate uh, what's going on here is to assign the second mixer source to the modulation wheel. 
we turn the mod wheel all the way down. So the mod wheel is now basically generating a zero. Its modulation value is zero because the modulation wheel is monopolar. This is the really important thing to bear in mind. Any value multiplied by zero is zero. So the output of the mixer in multiply mode is a flat line and we see no modulation being applied to the pitch. So we're on a really simple sine wave here. I've thrown oscillator two away. Now I'm going to turn modulation wheel up to maximum. So now it's generating a one, a virtual one. And when we have a look at the modulation range, it's toggling, it's, it's basically cycling backwards and forwards over the entire range as far as it possibly can, positive and negative. This sine wave is now having a bigger modulation effect than it would have done if the LFO1 had been operating on its own. How can I prove that? By using a different algorithm. If I switch to sum instead and turn my modulation wheel down to zero, now you can see the sine waves only operating over half the range. So I think the best way to think about the mixer is to treat both modulation targets as having a possible maximum range of plus one to minus one. They can be combined for a potential total range of plus two to minus two. Whether or not the modulation sources are ever able to attain that maximum is entirely dependent on the nature of the modulation source itself. If I switch the LFO to a square wave, a square wave oscillates between zero and one. It has no negative values. And so the modulation range that you see operating now is from zero to halfway up. The, it doesn't really matter how big this arc is, it's just an amount. The important thing is that the modulation range is half of the total positive arc. If I increase the modulation wheel to maximum, now these two modulation values are being combined. And so we've got a virtual one plus one for a, an imaginary two. And so our modulation range is now hitting its maximum. When the square wave's at zero, the modulation wheel is still having its positive effect. And we, so that's why we're only coming down to halfway up the positive arc when the square wave is at zero. I understand, you know, this is a little bit head bending. So the effect is that when I press the notes uh, on the keyboard, both of those notes are sharper than the C that I'm playing on the keyboard. If I switch back to sine wave, now it's oscillating around that imaginary center point from plus one to minus one on the sine wave with the extra boost of the plus one from the modulation wheel. Now these things can be combined for pretty interesting effects. If I get a sine wave on LFO1 and a square wave on LFO2, and I combine those two things together, now we get this really interesting effect where for half of the time we have a horizontal flat line. That's because when the square wave's at zero, anything multiplied by zero is zero. So half the time, this modulation output is zero and we get the flat line. When the square wave's at one, it's combining, it's being allowed to combine with the, square, with the sine wave. And now we see the modulation range for half of the time reaching the total maximum span, all the way from minimum to full positive um, on the mixer range. So it's basically a virtual minus two up to plus two if the square wave is allowing this algorithm to do anything at all. Of course, what's more interesting is what the hell does it sound like? You get really interesting modulation effects. Now, obviously, the speed of the two LFOs here is enormously important to the total effect. But you get that kind of, that's pretty cool, isn't it? There's pattern there. You can identify the pattern and you can kind of groove off it. In fact, you can see got these kind of like Batman ears kind of thing going on there. So that gives us an interesting rhythmic effect, which, you know, could very well inspire your next tune. So I think the mix is a really creative tool. One of those things that you just start plugging things together, twiddling some knobs and see what happens because you get really interesting, almost unpredictable values. Obviously, you can mathematically derive what's going on here if you really want to. But to be absolutely honest with you, you know, if you're using this thing, you're plugging it in 
and you're just messing around to see what kind of cool shapes you can get. It's all about being kind of musically creative. Right, I feel like I've earned a cup of tea after that one. I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot for watching.